I'm Nikki. And I'm Jess. She's the traumatized. And she's the abandoned. And, and welcome, welcome to, to our, our podcast. podcast. Where we talk about true crime, spooky things, and everything in between. And today, we are doing a chaotic chat. We're doing false confessions. Shy am. da 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 What's the what's the law and order thing? Uh, bow, bow, bow. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's not it. What is it? Uh, <laughs> when they like go in between each scene, I don't that's know what that noise is. That bow, bow. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Anyway, <laughs> this is what happens. So, guys, we were like, hey, let's do a challenge. Let's like not read our script. Wonder if we could do our intro. This is what you get when we go off script so here we are i mean that all that last bit was not even on script <laughs> not even close <laughs> but aren't you glad you're here mm. uh, anyway how was your week it was good good the husband got us like a couple's anniversary oh, yep, gift. yep 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 so we now have a not only do we have two xbox one this is mm-hmm. a series x mine is the other one so now we have three yeah. Xboxes and two Playstations. He got the he got us the PlayStation 5. Oh so God. love it. He's been on it every night since he got it. Oh, I'm happy. That's awesome. Good for him. I was gonna say we're not gonna talk about the PCs we also have. Yeah, we each have a PC as well. <laughs> And We're a just Switch. a gaming household. You, you know, know, we don't judge here. Honestly, I still have my 3DS too. And, you know, we still have an Xbox 360 and a mm-hmm. Wii. I've been trying to get the Wii set up again. I don't have a Wii. That's impressive. Yeah, when I get the... I think Beanie would like some some Wii games that are out there. But I have to yeah. rebuy them. <laughs> yeah. My Wii I bought when I was in high school with like my own money. Like I had saved oh, up dang. money from working and stuff. And on the same day, I bought myself a Wii and a Nintendo DS. Jesus, I was, like, I was balling. <laughs> but like my mom does doesn't approve of video games or whatever. Like still to the same. Day. Yep. So like if I wanted it, I had to buy it myself. So I spent like I saved all of my money so I could get the things I wanted. Hmm. At least she let you buy them once you saved up for them. Because my oh. mom probably wouldn't have. <laughs> I just gotta save the money because the games are still expensive. <laughs> yeah. Now that they're not. Well, like, now that they're retro. Production. Yeah. Right, retro. exactly. So now <laughs> retro games, Jesus. Any games that we played when we were younger are now retro, and I hate that. <laughs> so hate what? That. what do they call... The retro games that we call retro. Like, what are those called now? Classics? Like fucking ancient, ancient artifacts? <laughs> ancient I don't know. <laughs> like, what's a, what's a, um, like an N64? Like, we have what, we have an N64. So, like, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> Dinosaur. Shit still runs, but it's sad because you, you have to have those three plugs. And TVs mm-hmm. usually don't have those three plugs anymore. Our big TV does in the living room. That's oh, why thank God. I could okay, set, that's nice. That's why I tried setting up the Wii because oh. it has those three plugs. So I'm like, oh my God, I can actually play the Wii again. But I think I need a new controller and then I need like the game to actually mm. play it. Mm-hmm, oh. mm-hmm. You know what? You know what I fucking miss? I just remembered. Did you ever have Dance Dance Revolution DDR? <gasps> yes. With the mat? Yes. Fucking <laughs> loved that game so much. I loved that game. So I had a mat and everything. I loved it. Anyhow, how was your week? Or should we Just, skip that part? No, no, we can talk about it. My week was good. Um, I am training someone new. I mean, just put that out there. I am moving and switching jobs. That's part of what's going on. So it's really cool because I was able to tell my job and they're able to, they were able to like hire somebody. So I'm training someone to take my place when I leave, which is really kind of cool. And I love her. So we like literally spent like Thursday, Friday, like half training, half just like talking shit. And it was great (laughs) Um, because she's kind of in a very similar situation, which is funny. But yeah, so that's like half of what's going on. Big life changes. Other than that, just day by day step by step trying to get shit taken care of as much as i can we sent out our christmas gifts to each other 
today. <laughs> Mine's still in the box sitting in here because I didn't take it. January but it's 28th. in a box. It's in the <laughs> box, and that's what matters. Should we do an unboxing <laughs> over Christmas gifts? That would be a bonus bonus content on YouTube, maybe. <laughs> um, unboxing our Christmas gifts like two months later. <laughs> uh, that's fine. Yeah. 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 So uh ready for the fun fact of the day. Yes. Did you know that it is illegal to feed pigeons on the sidewalks and streets in San Francisco? Why? Uh, to keep the bird population. population. Yeah. yeah. So it so this is the the description. It may seem harmless, but in the popular California city, you could get in trouble. It explains that this law is in place because there are dozens of reasons why you shouldn't feed your pigeons friends. Mainly feeding pigeons harm our neighborhoods and can also harm the birds. Well, yeah, you're not supposed to feed like ducks bread and shit. Mm-hmm. It's not yeah, like explodes their, their stomach and shit, system. right? Yeah. They can't digest that shit. Yep. Anyway. <laughs> so today we're talking about false confession. Mm-hmm. 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 So, <laughs> guys, uh, in the last 40 years, hundreds of convicted prisoners have been exonerated by DNA and non-DNA evidence, revealing that police-induced false confessions are a leading cause of wrongful conviction of the innocent, including... 190 former death row prisoners which is insane yeah 190 like, people were on death row to be killed for something they didn't do they didn't do absolutely insane yeah so we're gonna go into a few descriptions we're gonna explain some things and then you know keep yeah yep, yep, yep. so yep. there are sequential processes that are responsible for the elicitation of false confessions misclassification corrosion and contamination and these three mm-hmm. kind of work all together to kind of lead someone being wrongly convicted mm-hmm. so the first one i'm going to talk about in, is misclassification and the first mistake occurs when detectives er- erroneously decide that an innocent person is guilty so mm-hmm. basically the cops look at somebody and like yep that's our man we're gonna interrogate that guy and they get like the the whole not blinders what is it called like tunnel vision. tunnel vision tunnel mm-hmm. vision is so bad for this because it's like once they think that they have somebody and they like they just zone in on them don't even and they don't even like look at other options what was the one that was really big oh what was the case that you did where it was the it was the police officer the murder of sherry rest Rasmussen. yeah 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 like they they missed so much evidence they're like oh she's a cop she didn't do it like yeah they missed so much they were evidence. like this is a burglary obviously a burglary gone wrong I'm even though it, it was like a half-ass setup as as a burglar yeah because like, once they looked back at the evidence they were like oh this was planted it was so obviously planted yeah that they had tunnel vision because misclassifying innocent suspects is a necessary condition for all false confessions and wrongful convictions. It is both the first and the most consequential error that police make. Mm. There are many cognitive errors that lead police to classify an innocent person mistakenly as a guilty suspect. Perhaps the most (laughs) prominent errors stem from poor investigation training. Innocent persons may be mistakenly targeted for suspicion and misclassification as guilty suspects for other reasons. For example, they may simply be the most readily noticed person who fits a general description given by eyewitnesses or others. As well as family members, like if somebody has been led to confess falsely to murdering their wife, children, parents, largely because police start with the assumption that most murders are committed by family or someone they know, and they proceed by ruling out the family before looking for other suspects, which sometimes is a good thing, but sometimes, again, they'll get tunnel vision and signal on one person, and so you kind of have to have like a understanding balance yeah of all Mm -hmm. like you can look Mm -hmm. at the family but you also have to look at other options right uh the next thing we're going to talk about is coercion Mm -hmm. once detectives misclassify an innocent person as a guilty suspect they often 
subject him to accusatorial interrogation. So instead of like going in there with an open mind, they right away go in there being like, did you do this? Like, how did you do this? Like getting it in the person's mind that they think I'm a suspect. Getting a confession becomes particularly important when there is no other evidence against the suspect, especially in high profile cases in which there is a great pressure on police detectives to solve the crime. And there is no other source of potential evidence to be discovered. And typically, typically there is no credible evidence against the innocent, but misclassified suspect. So they literally have no evidence, but a feeling in their gut that this person might have done it. And that can be led by bias. That can be led by, you know, past experiences. It, It's not... I don't want to say don't trust your gut feelings because obviously there's gut feelings there for a reason. But also, that shouldn't be the only reason why you put somebody on death row. Yeah. Like, there has to be more evidence than that. So once the interrogation commences, the primary cause of police-induced false confession is psychologically coercive police methods. Mm. psychological coercion can be defined in two ways the police use of interrogation techniques that are regarded as using force or threats Mm -hmm. so basically they're threatening you you know if you don't do this you're gonna get the death whatever you know how that goes Yep. Yep, yep yep or the police use of interrogation techniques that cause a suspect to perceive that he has no choice but to comply with the interrogator's command so like if you just confess you'll be able to go home if you just confess we'll get you some food like yeah just yeah, yeah. Just, just tell us and mm-hmm. we'll let you go that is not the case <laughs> the good guy bad good, good cop bad cop situation mm-hmm. so the third and final kind of step to having a false confession is contamination a confession is more than a i did it statement Mm -hmm. it also consists of a subsequent narrative that researchers have referred to as a post-admission narrative so police detectives understand the importance of the post-admission phase of the interrogation so basically what it's saying is like you get the person to say i did it and then after that they need to write down all of the details of how they did that crime that's Mm. what the post-admission narrative is oh yeah so they use it to influence shape and sometimes even script the suspect's narrative in addition interrogators encourages the suspect to attribute the decision to 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 confess to an act of conscience and urge him to express remorse about committing the crime so interrogators help create the false confession by pressuring the suspect to accept a particular account and by suggesting facts to of the crime to him, thereby contaminating the suspect's post-admission narrative. So they're like the detectives would be feeding the suspect the mm-hmm. information he needs to put down that makes him look the most guilty. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Say, so yeah, I have an example of this when you're done. Okay. The contamination of the suspect's post-admission narrative is thus the third mistake in the trilogy of police errors that cumulatively lead to the elicitation and construction of a suspect's false confession. So, like, I don't know if we were watching this together. I watched it, and this is what... One of the things that made me want to do this, and I know you definitely wanted to do it, too, was, like, I think we were watching something, and it was this one example where this body was found and they got a drone picture of this guy's white truck near the crime scene but it wasn't his truck but they had a picture of a white like a white truck Mm -hmm. that they basically convinced him was his and he was like i don't remember being there this is your truck how were you not there? Maybe I was there. Well, if you were there, did you do it? So they literally like mm-hmm. walked him down. I think you might have showed this to me. They walked him down the path of confessing when he wasn't even anywhere near it. But because of this one picture they showed him, it broke him thinking, well, I guess it could be a possibility. Well, I guess I could have been in the area. And then it just went down the straight rabbit hole. And it was mm-hmm. just like, it was so scary because he didn't do it. <laughs> like it was yeah. completely a false confession. But Because of that one evidence, like that one picture they had, they were able to talk him down and convince him that 
like, yeah, you did this. And he was like, even at the end, he was like, I can't believe I would have done this. But they had convinced him that he had. It was, it was, yeah, it's my I mean, fuckery. that's going to go into what you're about to talk about. Yes, so. it is. Look at that segue. <laughs> 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 so there are three psychologically distinct types of false confessions uh, voluntary compliant and persuaded voluntary confession is defined as one that is offered in the absence of police interrogation voluntary false confessions can be explained by the internal psychological states or needs of the confessor or by external pressure on the confessor by someone other than the police most voluntary confessions appear to result from an underlying psychological disturbance or a psychiatric disorder. A uh, yeah, so that's like the first version. So yep. yeah, it's just basically someone volunteers because they feel pressured from outside circumstances to confess. And not like movies are uh, not trying to be like, oh, this dramatized movie we watched is a great example. But there was where she had a psychiatric disorder. She was schizophrenic. So they had convi- So she was like, I could have possibly done it. Again, this is a thriller movie. So the whole movie, you're like, damn, is she actually like, did she actually do this? Mm-hmm. Because she she does. She has a psychiatric disorder. So you're like, maybe she did do it. And even she has at one point is convinced, trying to convince herself that she didn't do it. So I feel like that would be an example of like having like schizophrenia or, or hearing, you know, what's the other psychosis mm-hmm. and having pictured, you know, murdering someone or, or, or having those visions and then coming to and standing in front of somebody who's been murdered, you know, like it, it could be very disorienting. Anyways, the second one is a compliant false confession. And this is given in response to the police coercion, stress, or pressure to achieve some instrumental benefit. Typically, either to terminate and thus escape from the adverse interrogation process, to take advantage of perceived suggestion or promise of leniency, or to avoid a harsh punishment. So, So, yeah, this is what I was talking about earlier. When, you know, it's been like six hours of the police interrogating you. They're promising you, oh... You'll get to go home tonight if you just confess. And this is mm-hmm. what would lead a person to confess to something they didn't do. Because they, they've been through like 12 hours of hell and they just want to go home. They just want to go to sleep. They just yeah. want to be left alone. Yeah. Well, at night, you said six hours. I feel like I've heard horror stories of people being interrogated for like 24 hours plus. Mm-hmm. And like they'll leave them alone in like the interrogation room mm-hmm. and like by themselves like uh, to in their own thoughts and stuff like that like i've heard of some horror stories so yeah yeah so perhaps the most distinct aspect of compliant false confession is that they are made knowingly the suspect admits guilt with the knowledge that he is innocent and that what he says is false compliant false confessions are typically recanted shortly after the interrogation is over Mm -hmm. so again that quick like fine i did it get me out of here oh wait just kidding i didn't do it so yeah Yeah. uh and the last one is persuaded false confessions so persuaded false confessions occur when the police interrogation tactics cause an innocent suspect to doubt his own memory he becomes temporarily persuaded that it is more likely than not that he did commit the crime despite having no memory of committing it which is exactly what we're talking about with the truck thing Mm -hmm. like the dude was like at first he was like i wasn't anywhere near that i was completely somewhere else and they showed him a picture of his truck near the crime scene he was like well i don't remember ever parking there well you did well maybe i did and like he started literally questioning his own memory Mm -hmm. so persuasive false confessions typically unfold in three subsequent steps first the interrogator causes the suspect to doubt his innocence when first accused the innocent suspect thinks his interrogators are genuinely mistaken and counters by attempting to reason with them and persuade them of his innocence at some point however the suspect realized that they are not going to credit his assertions of innocence because he cannot reconcile the obvious contradiction between his knowledge that he is innocent and his belief that the police are truthfully reporting an unmistakable evidence of his guilt the suspect offers up the remaining basis for his belief in his innocence that he has no memory of committing the crime to convince the suspect that it is plausible and likely that he did commit the crime the interrogators must supply him with a reason that is sat- that satisfactorily explains how he could have done it 
without remembering it. And this leads to the second step in psychological process that leads to a persuaded false confession. Once a suspect is convinced, he comes to believe that it is more likely than not that he did commit the crime. And the third and final step in the making of a persuaded false confession, the construction of the post-admission narrative once the suspect has accepted the responsibility for the crime the interrogator pushes him to supply the details of how and why he did it that's crazy and and they'll be like oh like they'll push you know oh you don't remember this because maybe you like blacked out from anger or rage or maybe you know have amnesia from the trauma you had a drinking problem like Mm -hmm. yeah they'll just they'll supply the answers to the person which is fucking ridiculous like you have one job so scary why are you fucking up your job yeah it's terrifying so the consequences of these false confessions are disastrous we all know this Mm -hmm. for innocent individuals who are wrongly convicted and incarcerated and until Mm -hmm. the misconception that innocent suspects do not confess in response to psychological interrogation is dispelled police detectives will continue to elicit false confessions that lead to wrongful convictions but there's some things we could probably do to improve that yep 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 so what are we doing to reduce the number of false confessions and improve the accuracy of confession evidence that is introduced against the defendant at trial. Some researchers have suggested mandatory electronic recording of police interrogations in their entirety is the single most important policy reform available because it creates an objective, comprehensive, and reviewable record of the interrogation that all parties, police, prosecutors, defense attorneys, judges, juries, and even the public in high-profile cases can review. And I think that's why, like, body cams have been such a a high rise in things. But Mm -hmm. it is noted that in the research paper that we went over for this case is that only about 12 states require interrogation, Mm -hmm. like audio recording of some type in interrogations. But other states and I think smaller jurisdictions can decide if they want to do that or not. Mm -hmm. And also, FYI, the FBI does not record their interrogation. So always ask for a lawyer. First thing out of your mouth is ask for a lawyer. I do wonder if the FBI thing is because they have a lot like higher profile cases. Like probably, but still like they actually have like like, they actually have things that could national security. Thank you. That's exactly (laughs) what I was like. They like actually like mess with the national security of stuff. So maybe, Mm. but I don't know. Anyway, either way. (laughs) Anyway, researchers have proposed other reforms as well, including improved police training about false confessions, pretrial reliability hearings to exclude false confession evidence, putting time limits on interrogations, which, as I said, I think at one point Mm -hmm. it was like a 24 hour when it was insane, prohibiting certain interrogation techniques, greater provision of expert witnesses, testimony and cautionary jury instructions at trial while providing additional safeguards for vulnerable populations such as developmentally disabled and juveniles first of all developmentally disabled and juveniles i think should always have someone in the room with them you're not supposed to question a juvenile without an adult right okay good 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 i was not supposed to Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm not saying that it's not done right and that and well developmentally disabled people as well i really think yeah they really need to be yeah that's insane to me that that's not already a practice a thing. Yeah. yeah so now we're gonna go into a little section of some not so fun facts about false confessions so police induced false confessions are among the leading causes of wrongful convictions since the late 1980s six studies alone have documented approximately 250 interrogation induced false confessions Police-induced false confessions appear to occur primarily in the more serious cases, especially homicides and other high-profile felonies. You know, when they matter the most. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like More than two-thirds of DNA-cleared homicide cases documented by the Innocent Project were caused by false confessions. There have been 317 post-conviction DNA exonerations. 317 exonerations in the United States. 
Ah, Jesus. <laughs> the average length of time served by the exonerates is 13.5 years. That's insane to me. The average. That's, a, that's the average. That means like, these people have spent decades, an average of yeah, over decades a decade. of your life for something you didn't do. Like, imagine you got c- falsely convicted when you were 20. You're getting out at 33. Like, like also, like, after, like, a few years, do you just, like, give up? Do you just right. be like, like, all right, I guess I this know. is my life now. I live here in prison. Like, it's oh. insane. Yeah. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Uh, the average age of exonerees at the time of their wrongful conviction is 27. So they're in, like g- in their late twenties for most of them, I guess. Yeah. Still, but still, that's still like that's okay. An, an you average barely of thirteen started years. Started living your life. Yeah. So your average of thirteen years. That means the average is getting out when they're forty. So like, insane. Mm 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 mm. Ninety two percent of false confessors are men. That's what just interesting. It's a high. It's very it's a interesting. High high percentage i wonder if it's like a thing where police officers don't push women as hard as they do men or maybe i mean i think in general women have more of an innocence about them i think like people are less like or maybe to... women are more strong-willed where they hold out longer whereas men That's probably want to like i don't know like a people pleaser maybe are men like they want to please mm-hmm. the officers by like. I feel like that would be a woman thing, but I mean, maybe I could I definitely know. see women being more strong-willed. Like, no, bitch, I didn't do this. Like, I know yeah. I didn't. So. No offense to all the men out there. Um, We're, we don't know. <laughs> Why would you falsely confess? Let us know. Yeah, yeah. Comment. <laughs> Let us know. <laughs> Why would you do this? <laughs> were psychologically impaired and 10% had a diagnosed mental illness when they confessed. That's, that's, mm. (sighs) yeah. That's almost one fourth of the, Mm -hmm. are were psychologically impaired. That's so fucked. (laughs) Shout (laughs) out to New York. There have been 43 wrongful convictions in New York state alone. New York outpaces almost every other state in the number of wrongful convictions overturned by dna testing what's up with that new york i can't i don't <laughs> i'm leaving soon bye i don't know what to tell you sorry <laughs> and uh the last not so fun fact 22 states okay so 22 states require recording of interrogation correction on my part not 12 is 22 i had a two in there i was right on one of the numbers the number one of the digits was correct and that's all that matters so so 22 <laughs> states require a recording of interrogation but that we have 50 states mind you so half of more half. than half of those mm-hmm. do not require and like i said earlier the fbi does not require recording so be mm-hmm. careful very careful and now we're gonna go into um some story time story time <laughs> story time each of us picked a case of a mm-hmm. false confession and uh yeah so uh, what's yours buckle up <laughs> oh god <laughs> oh, i don't know Okay, so my story is about John Purvis. On November 8th, 1983, a Fort Lauderdale woman named Susan Hamley was found stabbed to death with a butcher knife in her home. To make things even more tragic, her (gasps) 18-month-old daughter, Shane, died of dehydration in her crib after being neglected for several days. I told you to buckle up. I did warn you. You did not tell me it was that (laughs) serious of a buckle. I should have read this before we started. Okay. 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 I'm I told not you okay. To buckle up. I'm sorry. I'm not okay. Fuck. Guys, as is tradition, I have broken Nikki. <laughs> we will be back here momentarily. Please grab some popcorn. Chaotic chat. <laughs> well, that did. You could have picked any other one. <laughs> It was, uh, <laughs> and you said it so calmly, like you was just like the grass is green, and now I'm moving on. Like, what do you mean? <sighs> okay, 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 okay. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. I just, I just need to stop thinking about it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so listen. Okay. Okay. Go, go, go. Pull- Police investigated a neighbor named John Purvis who suffered from schizophrenia. 
and lo- was looked upon as the town weirdo. This is why I chose the story. Okay. The, even though there was no physical evidence leaking him to the crime, Purvis would eventually confess to the murder and was sentenced to life in prison. However, because of his schizophrenia, Purvis had trouble distinguishing fantasy from reality. Mm-hmm. The first time he was questioned, Purvis's mother broke up the interrogation when he saw the de- when she saw the detectives attempting to intimidate her son. The next time they brought Purvis in for questioning, they made sure the mother wasn't present and he was coerced into making a taped confession. While Purvis was in prison, authorities seemed disinterested in pursuing other potential leads that popped up. The investigation was not opened up, reopened until 1992 when evidence came to light that Ham Wee had been murdered by two hitmen who were hired by her ex-husband. What the fuck? <laughs> They would soon be convicted of the crime. In January 1993, John Purvis was finally released after serving nine years. Wow. 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 And all because he had schizophrenia and people thought he was a town weirdo. That was literally so why he got So her husband convicted. killed her and... Hired. And the baby. Yeah. What, did he not account that the baby would be there alone? Like I don't think the baby was his. And that is speculation. <sighs> That's so, awesome. yeah. That John Purvis has been released. <sighs> Not ready. For that. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so You're my sorry. my case I covered uh Peter Riley, mm-hmm. and he was convicted of first degree manslaughter for killing his mother in Lynchfield County, Connecticut, in 1974. Based on his confessions after 24 hours of police interrogation, but some sources say the interrogation was less time than that. So one source said eight hours, one source said 12 hours, one source said 24 hours. Yeah. Either way, it sounds like it was a very long interrogation. Mm Mm-hmm. Always maintaining that the police had coerced his confession, Riley was exonerated two years later following the discovery of exculpatory... Is that how you say that? Exculpatory? Exculpatory. That's a hard one. I think it's exculpatory. Discovery of evidence. (laughs) (laughs) On the evening of September 28th, 1973, 51-year-old Barbara Gibbons was found dead in the bedroom of her home in Falls Village, Connecticut. Her son, 18-year-old Peter Riley, reported that he had discovered her body when he arrived home from a teen center church meeting shortly before 10 p.m. She had been stabbed to death. Mm-hmm. He placed five telephone calls for help. Riley and his friend Jeffrey Mado were the only people on the scene when the police arrived. Riley Mm. quickly became a suspect because of his presence at the scene, just showing up apparently, and his lack of emotion immediately Mm. following the incident. But I feel like shock, shock, like you come home from church to find your mother stabbed to death. Yeah. Like... (laughs) <laughs> that's hard though that's hard too though because i watched that one there is one like 2020 about like the stepmom who like basically m- murdered her stepson like her eight-year-old stepson i think we watched it and maybe that's not the one i wanted i skipped it but like she was she was said she was in shock but like so the the kid drowned and then instead of calling 911 she tried to resuscitate him at the beach and then drove him and then took like way too long driving him there so by the time she got to the er he was very much dead but she was like oh i was in shock that's why i didn't respond correctly and i'm like so it it's hard there's mm, yeah it's hard yeah it's, it's a hard line. Either way, he was held at the police station, subjected to an interrogation, and took a voluntary polygraph test, all without the presence of an attorney, hoping it would demonstrate his innocence. Mm-hmm. His mm-hmm. interrogation was recorded, and later transcripts revealed that although he was not intimidated or threatened physically... He became more and more confused and eager to please his questioners during the lengthy process. Yeah. Following the long hours of the interview, he developed a confession, which he signed. Mm. While awaiting trial, Peter Riley recanted his confession and sought legal assistance. While awaiting trial, friends and supporters rallied around Riley, coming together to post his $50,000 
bond and Riley returned to finish his senior year of high school. So mm. basically he got like charged or whatever, but everyone except for the police were like, he didn't Knew. do this. Yeah. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. What the heck? Nevertheless, on April 12th, 1974, Riley was convicted of first degree manslaughter and sentenced in late May to a term of six to 16 years in prison. Holy uh, shit. But in March 1976, two years later, Judge John uh, Speziel of the Superior mm. Court of Connecticut granted Riley a new trial on the basis of newly discovered evidence. A fingerprint found on the door of the Gibbons home cast suspicion on brothers Timothy and Michael Parmalee, who mm -hmm. had a history of conflict with the victim. Mm. Shocking. An auxiliary state trooper and his wife testified that they had seen Riley driving his car at the time of his mother's murder, corroborating Riley's account of his activities of him mm -hmm. driving home. The information found in the files of the original prosecutor by his successor was withheld from the defense. What? That confirmed that Riley had no time to kill his mother and dispose of all the evidence before the police arrived. They had the evidence. And they just didn't. And wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. On November 24th, 1976, <clears throat> the charges against Riley were dismissed. On June 1st, 1977, Superior Court Judge... Maurice Sponzo ruled that Riley had been the victim of questionable police and prosecutorial tactics. Mm -hmm. In addition to critiquing the state police and the Connecticut criminal justice system, Sponzo held that Riley's atypical behavior following the, the incident and his failure to display expected emotions contributed to his conviction. So basically, the judge said, yeah, they did a shitty job, but also you were acting kind of weird. Mm. Anywho. So, so recap, guys. False confessions are a real freaking thing. Please be aware of them. If you ever find yourself being taken in for questioning, ask for a lawyer. <laughs> that should be your first sentence. They ask you what your like, name is and you're like, I want my I lawyer. I need a lawyer. Like, <clears throat> guys, you don't know your name? Mm, yeah, no. my name is I want my lawyer. <laughs> yeah, I need my lawyer. I need a lawyer. <laughs> uh, even if you don't have one, the state has to provide you provide one. you with one. So, even if it's a, even if it's like you know a defense lawyer that is given to you by the state, it's somebody. It's somebody uh, who's going yeah. to be there to make sure that. As soon you know. as you say the word lawyer, that conversation is supposed to be shut down. Mm -hmm. So if the police. Still mm -hmm. try to ask you questions. Just keep saying lawyer, lawyer, lawyer. And you might have think, to. Yeah. And you might think that makes you guilty, seem guilty. It doesn't. It makes you seem smart. You're just like, protecting yourself. You are protecting you need yourself. You to protect yourself. And that won't be held against you. Like it, it's, there's a very big, um, like you want to be cooperative and you can be cooperative. You can be absolutely cooperative with someone in the room with you who is going to be able to help you. So and you don't make some and who understands like all the jargon and stuff that people that yeah. the police are like spit spitting at you yeah because i know i when i am nervous in a situation like your adrenaline's going you might say something freaking stupid like i mean i do it all the time it, it it's very hard if your mind and body is not trained to like handle stressful situations like that you're not going to be able to do it so have somebody in your corner who's going to at least be like you shouldn't answer that or you know like think about it or just be there yeah. so so they don't try to pull this bullshit on you yeah like and also i'm not saying also i'm just not saying, I'm saying not all police do this but there are there are not great police officers too so mm -hmm. just protect yourself please yeah. protect yourself yeah. yeah being interrogated is not fun oh yeah i've never done it so you have yeah 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 that's that's should we do a that is that a story for another day i feel like we talked i feel like we talked about it uh uh um it, it, it was just very scary because i was yeah. like i was like a 18 year old pfc and uh it's there was like three three interrogators like surrounding me and like that's terrifying yeah and like i didn't understand what was happening at the time like as yeah. like an 18 year old you're like called into like a superior's office and you're just like oh hey and then you're getting like drilled questions and you're like oh 
Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> and like, very scary. And but that's what I'm saying. Like, and you weren't even. And I don't. You could cut this. Out. You weren't even being interrogated for something you did. Yeah. No. Was, um. You were like a witness. So it's like even even as removed as you were from like that, it's still scary. So like, I mean, the information that I knew was definitely like charge worthy. Uh, that's why, like, when I went to the court martial and I was questioned at the court martial, like, I wasn't prepared. I didn't know why I was there. I had literally gotten the call at nine in the morning saying, "You need to be in Norfolk at 11 That's to terrifying. Testify. And I was that's like, so uh, "What? My uniform is not even like good to go right now." <laughs> that's your first thought. My uniform. <laughs> My <laughs> uniform. So like. So, like, you know, I, I get in yeah. the courtroom and I'm sat on the witness box and the judge, like, the military judge is looking me in my eyes and, like, anything you say from this point on can be held against you. And I'm like, I plead the fifth. <laughs> I need a lawyer. I don't know. <laughs> is it too late for that? I don't know. It's like, I was, yeah. I was terrified of my command and what they would, like, yeah. if they would, like, turn on me. So, I was just like, mm-hmm. nope, I'm d- nope, plead the fifth. i terrified. Can I go home now? <laughs> yeah and that, that's what i'm saying it's so it's scary guys so don't don't think you just need to be compliant and need to be because you can like i said you can be you could you can work with them mm-hmm. absolutely you know just make sure you have somebody there who is there for you too mm-hmm. um for your own protection anyway so before we end we're gonna talk about a couple of organizations that you can look up if you want to help or what have you um, I think the most popular one that kind of everyone has heard of is the Innocence Project. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the Innocence Project works to free the innocent, prevent wrongful convictions, and create fair, compassionate, and um, equal systems of justice for everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, the other, another one is the Exoneration Project, which I hadn't heard of, but apparently they are one of the best funded and largest and most successful innocent projects in the country. They are able to provide free forensic testing, experts, investigative services, an experienced litigation team to help clients go home where they belong. Mm-hmm. Another organization, Healing Justice, which provides opportunities for both individual and group peer support and healing to the exonerated and their families. So once they are exonerated, Healing Justice is kind of like a support for if they need anything once they're out in the real world okay. again. Mm-hmm. And then the Center on Wrongful Convictions of Youth is a nonprofit legal c- clinic that represents children and teenagers who have been convicted of crimes they did not commit. So if you want more information on those organizations, I suggest you check them out. Do it. Do it. Protect yourself. So that's it for this episode, guys. If you enjoy the podcast, please do not forget to follow us. Leave a comment if you're watching on YouTube. Hi. Uh, like and subscribe. There's also this bell thing that you can hit that like alerts you when our um, podcasts go live. So do that. We try to go live. Not live. We try to make our, our podcasts go up on Saturday. So... That's the thing that we're doing. But sometimes we forget, so it goes on Sunday. But most of the time, it's on Saturday. Most of the time, we're on time. Even though I haven't done ours today. But it's fine. I'll do it right (laughs) We'll do it right after. We're going to do it right after (laughs) we record this. So it'll still go up on Saturday. It'll just be later. It's fine. (laughs) We're professionals. We do this for a hobby, guys, and we love it. So anyway. You can also find us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok with our username at TTATA Podcast. And in the bio of all of our Social media is the link to our email. If you have any comments, concerns, suggestions, hit us up. Let us know what you want us to talk about. Yeah, I'm still looking for any any kind of suggestion for like <laughs> horrifying history. And what's the other one I really I can never do is the deadly old- engineering. Yes, deadly engineering. I feel like <laughs> those two are the worst for me. I don't know why. I just want to find one that you haven't, and it's hard. Anyways, it's not thanks. that hard. I like it. it you're right. It takes more think- effort. Oh, okay. It takes more effort, and if people would just you- email me ideas, <laughs> then I could just use those. I think so. also you think I know more than I know. That's true. That is true. I've surprised you a couple times, and I'm like, oh, I thought you would have known that. No. 
No. Thanks for listening, guys. Next week, we're going to be circling back to the top of the list. We're going for abandoned places. So I'm so excited here. for mine. We're here. I, this is home. I like abandoned places. <laughs> uh, abandoned and true crime. That's like mm-hmm. our bread and butter, I think. So it's it's nice to be back. And with that, we're going to leave you with this inspirational quote. Sometimes when you're in a dark place, you think you've been buried, but you've actually been planted. Oh, hmm. <laughs> By Christine Kane. Thanks, Christine Kane. Jesus, that is that kind of hit me too. Anyway, love it. And it's time for you to grow and thrive. Yeah, go and thrive. And guys. reach the sunshine. Hey, reach that for rhymed. it. <laughs> okay, Jesus, I'm you're done. a poet and you done. didn't know it. <laughs> Let's say bye before this spirals anymore. <laughs> oh, we're spiraling. All right. <laughs> See you guys next week. Have a great week. Bye. Bye.